test, test. I think this will be all right. Looks like it's my washer going off. But you know what? exercise where it's sort of talk out loud and I also get to record my process for doing these sorts of things and learning these sorts of things. So we're really going to be learning together, which is nice. I've read some of the material already, so I definitely would recommend going to that extent if you're going to try to follow along with me, but really this is going to be about doing some of the exercises in the book. So probably important to, and I won't cover specifically how to download the software that we're going to be using, which is R, our studio, as well as download JAGs or WinBugs, depending on what your software is. This book does a great job at talking about how to do those things in the first couple of chapters, chapter one and two, two specifically here. and. It's going to give you a good sense of exactly what you're going to want to cover or what you're going to need in order to learn about or follow along with the book um, and use the software appropriately. Right. So I won't cover that. I'm going to start at chapter three. So I'm going to be operating that. You know, we have some general understanding about what's Bayes' rule, 
what's Bayesian inference and why are we interested in using Bayesian inference and, you know, primarily from my understanding is we want to understand or we want to quantify the degree of belief uh, surrounding a probability, so surrounding a, prom a parameter or a set of parameters, and these parameters are meaningful to us in some way uh, based on how we conceptualize them, and we're going to calculate them using inverse probabilities, where we have information about data in hand and we define some likelihood um, which is specified in our, our code and then we are using resampling approaches in order to quantify the marginal likelihood in such a way where we then can um, calculate the posterior probability which gives us a lot of interesting and, and useful information about the process or parameters that we're interested in such as the probability of a given value for that parameter as well as other things that might be baked into what that parameter actually represents. So a lot of interesting stuff here. I'm just going to be going through the book. You can find the book online as well. So I won't link that because I'm not really sure if that the gray area of that, but you know, if you did some Googling, I'm sure you'd be able to find it. But I also have a, my own paper copy. It's a great book. I highly recommend it goes through some great examples of just talking about you know what exactly this is if you don't know what this is yet then this video series is probably not going to be for you but and then just going through the process and I think procedurally that's what's going to be most important and why I'm doing this video series so we'll just get started there then and all right I'm really just going to hit the ground running here and I'm going to start reading the exercises to myself and I'm just going to try to work through the, the problems in real time. And that might be interesting uh, to some people to watch along, but really, like I said, this is a, a practice more for me to get a sense of how to do these things. So, And also, you know, practice potentially streaming in the future. Cool. I'll pull this over here for now and see if I can find the first question. So I'm just going to start in chapter three. Chapter two, like I said, is going to tell you how to use wind bugs, which you know I'm semi-familiar with. But essentially, what we're doing is we're going to write our model in a text file, which is going to be passed through using our code to interact with bugs, which is downloaded on your computer at this point, and then you know, R will execute the, or I think JAGS executes the, the sampling procedure and then spits out the results back to R. Cool. So part three, or part two, parameter estimation. So we're just going to start with the exercise 3.1. And what's cool about this is all the code's online too. So I'm going to be able to you know, execute the code and like, think about some of the answers to these questions. Right. So the first question, then, I could probably just do it like this. So carefully consider the posterior distribution for the parameter, given that we have these, uh, this data. Based on the visual impression, what is your estimate of the probability that the rate is higher than 04, but smaller than 06? Okay. How'd you arrive at your estimate? Well, to answer this question, I'm going to need some information, so I'm going to go and look up, 
seems like the code it would be in rate one. So luckily I pulled out the code from rate one and I have it here. And I'm just gonna translate this all into our markdown as I go along, which uh, our markdown is going to be a nice way so that you know when I'm done with this, I'm able to share these notes potentially um, on a website or something and just you'll be able to have the code along with me. Yeah, and you know I'm not going to explain on markdown here, but essentially um, what it does is just it renders the document that we're interested in. It renders the code in a, a way that is one could is legible, I guess, to if you wanted to share this code with someone or something. So, like I said, I won't talk about this here because we're really just going to try to get these exercises done. So I'm going to load the R to Jack's library, and I've done all the other necessary procedural things here. And you know, we have data. So this is K equals five is the number of successes. And then in order to do the sampling, we need to have some initial specified values. So here are the initial starting chains, what they're called. The chains are part of the sampling procedure that we're going to be using. Markov, multicolor Markov chains, and you know, we'll talk more about this as we go along, but just to give you a picture of it, you can imagine you know, iteratively, iteratively uh, sampling, and you know I'm learning this along with you, right? So what we're doing is we're iteratively sampling from the uh, likelihood in such a way that we can gather enough information that it would provide us with a unbiased or accurate estimate of the parameters. Um, and we do so uh, multiple times across a large, large amount of samples. Right. And there's some procedural things we need to do in order to check these samples as we go through. And we'll, we'll do that. some issues with the file structure here. I should probably make data book examples. Or where is this? Wait, text one. Started. Yeah. Cool. So, what this code is doing then, we're setting our initial values, and then we're going to have our sample here. And we're running JAGs on our data, which in this case, right here. You have to also have to tell it what parameters you're interested in. So here we're only interested in theta. We have two chains, so we set some specifications for where we'd like the chains to start as they start randomly sampling, because initially each, I believe the chain values are dependent on one another, that is, they're correlated to some extent, but over time they become more stochastic or random. I think that's what it is. So it's important to just set some values here, but like I said, you'll be able to check and you can burn out or burn in, set a burn in period where it won't count samples when they're um, more dependent to one another. And 
let's go ahead and actually just look at the the model then. values but it doesn't know what data is so this is data so now we have our data the initials values and now we just have to look at the model itself so this one yep cool so let's break down with this Yeah, let's break down what this says. This is important. So what we're doing here So what we're doing here is we are specifying our model in I think it's one bugs or Jags code, either or. But what we do is we use model, curly brackets, and then we have theta, which is our parameter of interest, which is distributed by this distribution, which is a beta distribution. And we have a uniform prior, so uninformative prior. And then we specify what our counts are going to be, so our success rate here, um, which is binomial, um, which is distributed with number of successes or with the parameter theta and n. And this is nicely graphically shown here, where we, these are graphical models, so probabilistic graphical models, and they have information about the parameters here how they're distributed, which probability distributions are distributed, and then um, what is observed and not observed. So things that are colored, this convention can vary, but here the convention is saying that for n and k, we have observed these because they're shaded dark. And then for theta, it's something we haven't observed. Right. And what we want to know then is these the number of successes based on information about how based on the success rate and the total number of samples trials and we have information data we have data about the samples and the, the number of trials or success rates and the number of trials Shaded known values. Oh, one other thing: it's the circular versus square. So circular values are continuous, and square are discrete. So it counts and such. Maybe yeah, counts and stuff, and then we have their continuous distribution or a continuous parameter. All right. So let's see if we can just run this and see what happens. So we've loaded the package, we've specified that. And now we're just going to see if we can sample. Get them right to it.
It's weird. So, it's telling us that we have an error. The best approach is probably just going to be to use a package called here. So here is a way to specify the directory that your code is being executed from. And it has really nice syntax. So when we specify it here, notice we just are naming the, what the text file is. But when we use here, we have to point it in the right direction. So I need to go up and see where the project starts. Let's see. Some books is it kind of like getting started? Yeah, so what we do here, we need to just specify each of these. Super quick. Great. So I really just want to look at it, and I think there's some good. If I remember correctly, I think I have some good ways to just get a quick pot of the data. Yeah, I can do something like this. So here we're calling theta, we're going into the samples and taking from the bugs output, and we're just taking all of the posterior distributions from the bugs output. And then I'm going to see if I can just make a, a plot out of that. So we see here that the posterior distribution is centralized on 0.05, which is a chance, right? A 50 50 chance. If we're talking about, in this example, we're talking about just a binary process. So it makes sense we had uniform priors. And the data itself was you know, uniform or 5 out of 10, so 1 half. So we went from a uniform distribution to um, a distribution that is highly reliant on the likelihood information. So that's where we get this output. So just taking a look then at the question. higher than 0.4. Well, you could calculate this, right? Um, 
so if we oh, just on visual impression. Here. So we did a pretty good job. You can see it's just like a rough. But we we ran the code. So presumably you'd be able to a visual inspection in the area or the under the curve here that had more density at point four is more likely to than the area under Point six. I think that's what it wants us to like visually inspect. I know that you can. There's a way to calculate those rates as well. Oh we'll wait for that. That's a question mark. So now consider the posterior distribution for theta given six s five out of ten based on visual impression. What is your estimate of how much more likely is point five rather than point seven? Okay, so let's look at ours. Just make that. So that's good. So you can clearly see there's more density here. And this is just a histogram, right? So if I wanted to do density, I would have to write out some more code here. But just as the sheer counts, right, in this plot, you can tell there are more samples of theta, right? So there's more samples of theta that we identified in our posterior distribution than there were at 0.7. For example, you can just see from looking here on the graph. And I guess we can just genome. I guess I have to lower this. Maybe some helper functions. Just to look. So yeah, just looking at the counts here, there's more than at this value. So that's pretty useful. Hmm. All right, next question. Alter the data so that we're at 1500 and compare the posterior rate to your original work. All right, so to do that, I'm actually going to save this plot as P1, because I think this will be useful. Uh, programmatically, this is probably not the best approach, right? But I'm just going to, now that I save this as P1, I'm just going to go and change the data so that. So, what would I predict? We have a higher count, so it's just going to be more precise, right? I have more data observed, but the data the proportionally isn't changing. So, let's see what happens. And we'll do this again. Put P2. This package patchwork. It's a nice way to just it has clean syntax for combining graphs together. So we'll try that. This is your looks like. So then all we have to do is do p1 plus p2 here. And it'll give me a side by side comparison of the two. 
Oh, they don't seem that different. I do want P2. I guess we can get some labels. I don't remember the syntax for labels. It's not important. P1's on the left, P2 on the right. So it doesn't look that different, different at all. Let me check my code. the same. Looks like our intuition was right here. It's pretty precise out of the way. For both 50 and we run the analysis with many more samples. So end iterations. This will take some time but there is an important point to understand what controls the width the quality of the approximation, the smoothness. Right, so it looks like it's trying to give us the intuition that as we increase the amount of iterations here, we'll get a better fit. So if I just add it, again not discriminatively different. should go pretty fast. Hmm. Let me change that back now. It's a lot of samples there. Plotting this right, it takes a lot. <laughs> so the smoothness of the it's the histogram should increase as we increase the number of iterations. Yeah. Part of the issue here, too, is a, a binning thing, I think, when we're looking at the histograms. You know, that's also the case that it would be harder. We're just not explicitly making the bins. Uh, they vary, I think. That's why we're not seeing bigger differences, but the estimates are more precise. You can think of more estimates within each of the bins. But we have more estimates, so we could do more bins. not seeing that because we said we are we specify the bins weights. Nice. Solve that problem. Alright. Alter the data. 
So we're going to have a lot of successes. So this is going to move the posterior. Now. So now we're going to have 99 successes out of 100 trials. That's going to give us a posterior that's very much towards successes, right? The there we go. Nice. So now zero and this one. Now we have basically no information. In this case, it's going to influence. You can send it in the other direction. Yeah, all the way to the other side. Oh, okay. So yeah, you can think of it before we had a uniform distribution across all probabilities of theta, and now we have higher likelihood at lower values of theta, which indicates that our prior distribution is telling us that it's now less likely that we are going to see more successes in the future. Next question. So now it looks like it's going to move into different parameterizations of the model. So instead of just looking at here, we were just assessing the success rate using the data parameter, but now we're going to add this difference parameter here, which has this double circle, which means it's determined. And determined here means that all the information that we estimate from our probabilistic parameters is sufficient for us to calculate all possible values from those parameters of the difference parameter here, so represented by delta. So we're going to be looking at the difference between the two rates, which are estimated in the same approach we did before, but now it's just two of them, and we specify that in the model. So let's go take a look at that. So now we're just going to go through and we're basically doing the same thing. file size here. So in this case the difference between the two rates we specify both of the number of successes which are binomial distributions here with parameters theta and then one and they are both each have their own rates of success and then the priors we have for these rates of success are both uniform and then we are going to calculate the deterministic value. So this is almost a helper thing, because I think we could 
I do calculate the values for theta. Or get the posterior distribution delta by just the information from the two thetas, right? But we can also just incorporate that into the model in the first place, which is really useful. Stream. Yeah. Do you want to go to the bookstore today after your class at five? What, is my practice on shoot? Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Go which one? Barnes and Noble. Thanks. I'm gonna go try and pick up a. The Adam Grant book. I think I'm gonna pick up two books, but that's mm -hmm. one of them. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Cool. Cool. Sweet, going to the bookstore. All right, where was I? Yeah. Right. 3.2 exercise. So compare the data sets K1. <laughs> compare the data sets. I'm not sure if it's helpful if I show this or not. I don't want this to be confusing. I mean, <laughs> it's already conf <laughs> somewhat confusing, but. Um, Alright, compare the data sets K18, K10, and K27, and N210. So compare these two data sets. Try to predict the effect that adding more trials on the posterior has for the difference. Okay. So. Now we need yes, like this file, right? In terms of like accommodation and like stuff. So I'm gonna start looking into like and here we'll have the data outlined right here. The parameters that are different now too, because right? we're interested in both all the thetas. And Delta, the difference parameter. Make that clear. And then we just have to make clear where we're getting, where the, t the text file is. So we parameter estimation. Yeah. So it doesn't run because we didn't close. <laughs> number of initialized chains not um, computable. Yeah, I see. I also opened the JAGS file. Let me open the JAGS file. This is what I'm looking for. This should be right.
so there I was just forgetting uh, the director again. Which I can I gotta figure out this directory thing. It's very long. But we, there we go. Samples are in. Looks like if I run it. <coughs> this is our delta parameter. You know, I don't actually like the plots they output, or they, they specify. And I guess for instructions, so there, we made the first difference. Now let's look at the variations in the parameters, right? So they wanted us to specify a couple changes. So five. Specify some changes to the parameters. So let me pull these over here. And I'll just go through each of those. So I think it also wanted us to just talk about intuition behind that. So now for K1, we'll have. to do this and we're also going to have 80 100 70 and 100 so just looking at these parameters I'm trying to develop an intuition about what's going to be different, it's clear that the parameters just vary in order here, so order of magnitude. So we're just adding more samples. So like we saw before in the exercise earlier, when we just added more samples, all it did was give us a more precise estimate. So with the increase in the amount of samples, we could predict that we're just going to get a more tighter estimate so around the um, expectation for the delta parameter in this case. Yeah. And we can go ahead and test that now. Let's take a look at that. I'll go ahead and make the two plots. So we'll, we'll shut these off. We'll run this. Here's this plot. Which I guess I said before, I don't really like that plot, so I'm just going to make a quick cheese plot of these distributions instead. Because I mean, look at this. You know, just give me delta. Yeah. Pretty hmm. enough. I'm not sure I could write some code and make this look better. Like, for example.
actually don't know what I am pressing here incorrectly. I think if I just do... Oh, well because the, the variable doesn't have a name, so I'm going to just do this. My data has to be a data frame, right? So I know where to do this. Travesty, right? I shouldn't go through and move up and cut out variables, internal variables, and stuff. But really, it's just about playing with the parameters. Try the data at zero with one observation. Zero success is one observation, and zero success is two observations. So now I want to instead look at the data with zero observations. Zero successes. Five successes or once five successes. I oh, know each had zero successes and then they also each had actually no observations as well.
the word? Or spread? And you can tell it's more spread because if you look at it, it relative to the It looks like delta is most likely to be pretty low. So it bases this on well, we had a uniform distribution before, right? And now we have observations. Basically no evidence. of high success rates. But that's not what this is asking. This is asking for the difference between the two success rates. So it's trailing off or uh, wider towards the larger end of the difference because we have observations here. But So there's some evidence that there could be a positive difference between them, right? Where if it's calculated with theta one minus theta two, so theta one still being larger. Why would theta one be larger here? It's derived from a uniform distribution, but so is. Two. I guess one of the best ways to just see would be if I change some of these values here. No successes. But what does it look like at two? So much evidence, but potential evidence. So as we got more information, it seemed like the tail was getting longer. Where there 
there's more possible option outcomes for there to be a difference though the probability of there being a difference is still pretty low. So we're basically out of time today. I mean, we really didn't cover that much ground. But we'll make it through, since this is the last question in this series of questions, we'll go ahead and do it. So it says, in what context might different possible summaries of posterior distributions here, difference per unit, be, oh, distributions of this value be reasonable, and what might be important to show when might it be important to show the full posterior distribution? So if we were just looking for the most likely difference, or if we were trying to infer that there was a difference between the two rates, a point estimate gives us that, right? In addition, we also want to know how likely it is or how the probability that there is no difference between the two. So in that case, we want a credible summary. So you can actually get that with the summary of the samples. If you looked at the credibility interval, you see that one, it, there is a probability in the 95% credibility interval that the parameter is equal to zero. So that's important. So we want to see that coverage is not zero. However, the most likely is somewhere around this, this fair effect size, I'd say. For psychology, at least, this would be reasonable for size, but you know, it's, we have to be cautious of this because of what we're seeing here in the credibility interval. So this really changes our, our beliefs about whether we're actually uh, seeing an effect or effect here being the difference between the two rates. Yeah. Question is going to be affirming a common rate. Then we're going to get some predictions. So I'll go ahead and you know we'll do the common rate stuff just because you know, posterior predictions is a whole other topic really. So it'd be nice to just we'll cover this and then we'll wind for the day. All right. So I want me to try a couple different rates again. Oh well, first you know changing the model here. So instead, we're going to be inferring from a single rate as before. Not that that's the same, but before, we saw that we thought there were two rates and we wanted to know if they were different from one another. So you can imagine if we were doing this, right, we see that it's, it's, it's high probability that the difference between the two rates is about zero. So we could say, well, maybe they're the same rate. So we move forward and we go and we just say, okay, they come from the same rate now. And we're going to estimate it as such. And when we represent this, this just wants to demonstrate that we could also represent it like this. And we can start using these subscripts, which becomes more handy as we move to more complex graphical models, hierarchical models, where these are going to be our best friends in a lot of ways. Which we'll see, I think, going down the road. Cool, so we'll let's grab, let's go take a look over here at the text file. Great. Cool. So 
in this case, uh, we can uh, k1 distribution these parameters, and then we have we'll have to specify one prior here for the data parameter. All right. Data values. Let's see. Good. Here's the distribution. Great. Here's the range. Now I'm just going to change some of the values here. So it's 14 successes. Total of 20 trials and 16 successes in a total of 20 trials. Nice. If we have uniform priors before, we're going to have a, a more like, pretty high success rate if you're just looking at the values here. Yeah. Pretty high success rate. Reporting the inference about the common rate, I would probably report the credibility in order to which in this case. Success rate across examples is on average 73. And this interval is pretty tight and it's high. So people are pretty successful. People are good at the binary process, whatever that is. So now we're going to change the data again. It wants us to look at a different set of rates. And this time we're going to look at. Very unsuccessful person, it looks like it's about 10 rates. Um, a very successful person, so in all 10s. So, this is interesting where we have a person with 10 trials at zero rate, and the person is perfect. So, we have these like two opposition samples in terms of information we're getting. So this should even it out, I think, right? Towards the middle. And from priors. Yeah, so you look at that. To around 50. In fact, uh, theta indicates like basically 50. Nice. 
but it's hard. I wouldn't believe that influence. So it asks if I believe that influence, and I'd say, well, no, it's the data sets are really pulling in both directions. So it'd be hard to believe that. You know, more data here would be helpful. Or you know, we could infer that there are different rates at that at that point. So now, once again, the last question, it's just going to have us compare data sets again. And then another success rate. some evidence of success, so I think it'll be a high than 0.5 for that one. We'll see. And here, really this is this is interesting, see, because we're we're calibrating our ability to infer information about what the prior distribution is going to be. Okay, so that's Slightly, um, I guess we could look at the intervals. So the intervals are sort of larger. Yeah, so the intervals are wider here. There's more data. So let's see what happens if we do this. Okay. Which, I mean, really, we have no information here, right? Yeah. So the result back to being pretty set. And middle here. So we go from middle point and then just right. Cool. Alright. So this is a pretty good first day. We got through chapter oh we didn't get through chapter three but here. We got through a, a couple exercises. So we're in prior plus theory prediction. We I think we made a lot of pro good progress for the first day here so some logistic things, which is navigating some of the dependencies for directories, and then learning to read some of the JAX code, which I'd really like to do some stamp code next time and kind of comparisons. I think that would be really useful. Which is, this is just another language for doing these sort of simulations or sampling procedures. So we'll try to do that in conjunction as we do the, the JAX code, so you can just see the differences as well. I think it's really helpful as, the, as we go through the, the problem sets. So next time we'll start with prior and posterior predictions, which really gives us some information about how better off we are at extracting information from the model. Let's see, let's see, one conceptual base provides a bridge. Alright, so we'll look at what our model would predict. You know, if we would just sample the model as is with the priors we have, what would it look like? And in uniform cases, you know, we're going to get a sample of all of the equal. That would be the prior predictive distribution, right? Then we get our, we do the inverse probability, we get our posterior, and then we can also check. Now. So this is like simulating or doing prediction on our data set so we can see how well or if we're doing better. Or I don't know if it's a better in this sense, but what would the data now look like given that we are 
it's like putting the probability dis distribution in action. Over day gives us relative power. Data. Interesting. All right. So we'll start with rate four next time. Thanks for tuning in for my first stream. This was pretty good, I think, for the first day. Definitely a lot of kinks to work out, but yeah, tune in next time if you're interested in following along this month. Like I said, I'm just going to be talking through navigating some of these problems. If anybody has any interesting or anybody has any questions about things I could cover specifically, it would be nice to engage with people on this stuff and see you know, maybe I can change the direction of what I'm interested in doing. And just in the future though, if you think this might be a little too bland or something, um, bland in the sense that uh, these models are pretty not as interesting as what we're going to be talking about later, like when we're simulating models like this, which I, for example, this model, I believe, yeah, this is like a model for a correlation, which I think is really interesting when you think about how you would extract information about a correlation using a frequentist approach. But we can represent this graphically and then estimate if the parameters necessary to extract information about the correlation. So this is like a first use case of just observing conventional statistics that we would tend to use in a in a being proper or being estimated in a computational model. So that's kind of cool. And then they get they get more complex over time. So we're going to be running through a lot of neat examples and use cases. And I think it will be really good practice. And I look forward to doing these with you in the future. So that's it for now. Thanks.